Hello, welcome to Taj Hashmi's vlog. Taj Hashmi is reading history and culture. I will be lecturing on various aspects of history, culture, politics, society, religion, current affairs, international affairs, local politics, politics within country, intra-country relationships in a vast areas from South Asia to Southeast Asia, the Middle East, Europe, and North America. I'm a trained historian, I'm a cultural anthropologist. I will cover uh, areas in my expertise, interest, and experience, research and teaching experience uh, for the last 50 odd years. So before I introduce the subject topics, which hopefully you will be watching and listening to me during uh, for an indefinite period, as long as I will be able to do it. Before that, before I introduce the subject, I introduce myself, who I am. My name is Tajul Islam Hashmi. It's a mouthful name, and I have shortened it to Taj Hashmi. My first books were published uh, with the title of my name as Tajul Islam Hashmi, but last two books I have only used the shortened version, version Taj Hashmi. Palgrave Macmillan, Westview Press, Routledge, and Sage, and Papyrus of Calcutta have published five of my books. I'm talking about them shortly, but beside, before that, I introduce myself, my family, my background, my ethnicity, and identities. I was born in India, Assam. Dibrugar, a town not far from Arunachal Pradesh in Northeast India, which, is, which borders China, which is a disputed territory between China and India. So I was born in Northeast India and an Assamese family. My mother was Assamese. My grandfather, maternal grandfather, was a police officer in Assam. He had a long life. He was born in 1900 and died in 1998. And my family, my parents moved to then East Pakistan, which is Bangladesh, when I was only three and a half year old in 1951. Long time back. I was born on 26th September. 1947. I am one of those midnight children born soon after the partition in the year of the partition. Catastrophic or useful, how, whatever way you see it. My father was from North India, Uttar Pradesh or UP. He came from a Sufi family and having very diverse ethnic background. My father was from Jaunpur, and from his father's side, he was a direct descendant of Bahauddin Zakaria Multani, a saint who lived in Multan in southern Punjab, who died in 1262. Bahauddin Zakaria Multani was a Sufi, was a saint. He was a maternal grandson of a very famous Sufi of Gilan, Iraq, Abdul Qadir Gilani or Abdul Qadir Jilani. And Abdul Qadir Jilani's family came from Hijaz. Bahauddin Zakaria's father was from Khwarizm. Khwarizm is a land in between Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, 
now it's in Turkmenistan, where the famous mathematician Al Khwarizm came from. And naturally, I have Arab, Turkish, Punjabi, North Indian, Assamese, and by default, <laughs> Thai DNA. So I am. I have got a very diverse ethnic background, and my parents came from two different parts of India, and they were from outside India as well. Because Assamese people originally came from Thailand, so I am roughly little bit of Arab, little bit of Turk, little bit of Thai, little bit of Indian, born in India, grew up in Bangladesh. And so as I was born in India, I was an Indian, migrated to Pakistan, grew up in East Pakistan. So I, I was Pakistani, or East Pakistani. Then we became Bangladesh in 1971, a Bangladeshi. Then I went to Singapore, worked there at the National University of Singapore. And I took Singapore nationality. So I was a Singapore citizen until I migrated and became a Canadian national in 2004, 2005. I held three passports and so many diverse ethnic background. This is to arouse some interest in me among you that uh, I'm an interesting character in that way, having diverse ethnic background, but that doesn't guarantee anything, that doesn't give any guarantee that I am uh, endowed with certain qualities, qualifications, that was not my purpose. But I'm an interesting person in that way that I grew up in a Urdu speaking family and also spoke Assamese with my mother and my uh, close relatives, but learned Bengali at school, spoke Urdu at home, and Bengali and English at school and college and universities. So, and I'm one of the few Bengali authors who is not ethnically Bengali. Uh, Abu Said Ayyub of West Bengal, and uh, I can name uh, renowned Bengali poet. Sikandar Abu Zafar, who was also Urdu speaking like me. So I can identify me myself as one of the three Urdu speakers turned into Bengali and continued to uh, write in Bengali and English. And I've written some poems in Urdu as well. Urdu remained my first language. Still today, I think in Urdu, I count numbers in Urdu, but I'm more Bengali than many Bengalis. So, very interesting character indeed. And after migrating to East Pakistan, to a small town called Siraj Ganj in Northern Bangladesh, where I had my first school degree, Secondary school certificate exam, I crossed it, in, passed it in 1964. I was relatively a good student. Then I went to Dhaka College. I did my 12th grade there in humanities. Then I went to Dhaka University to study Islamic history and culture. That was not by choice, but by default, because I was keen on joining Pakistan Army but I was disqualified on medical grounds. So by the time I came to the university for enroll, enrolling myself in the university, uh, most departments were closed. They were not taking any more newcomers, new students. So I had to go to Islamic history department, but I have no regrets. There I met world-class historians, including ABM Habibullah, who is was, a, was an authority on medieval Indian history. Besides him, I had very 
renowned professors at Dhaka universities where I was there from 1966 to 1971. I had my B honors and MA in Islamic history and had sociology and political science as my minor subjects. Then I taught at the University of Chittagong for a few months. Then I joined Dhaka University in 1973. From there, I went to uh, Australia, University of Western Australia, to do my PhD in South Asian history. I wrote my PhD thesis on peasants and politics in East Bengal, 1920-1947, which later was published from Westview Press and Routledge as Pakistan as a Peasant Utopia. This is sort of a cultural uh, anthropology and social history combined together. Then I did my postdoc at Oxford, uh, Queen Elizabeth House, Oxford University, and Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. And, and I also taught at several universities, nine on three continents. Uh, Chittagong, 1972, Dhaka, 1973, 1988. Meanwhile, I taught at Curtin University in Australia, Perth, the National University of Singapore for 10 years, up to 1998, then Independent University of Bangladesh as professor and dean. Then I went to University of British Columbia, UBC, taught there for three years, uh, sorry, uh, two years. And then I taught at Simon Fraser University, both in Vancouver. Then I joined the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Honolulu, Hawaii, where I taught for four years. Then I went to Tennessee at a small university called Austin P. State University. I not only taught Islamic history and Islam, I also taught South Asian history, Middle Eastern history, Southeast Asian history, from Indonesia to Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia. Then I taught uh, security studies, Homeland Security of America, counterterrorism, uh, counterinsurgency, understanding terrorism. I taught at military as well as civil civilian setup. I have uh, five books, five monographs. My first book was in Bengali, as you can see, Oponibeshi Bangla. It came out from Calcutta, published by Papyrus Press in 1985. Then my second book was the revised version of my PhD thesis, Pakistan as a Peasant Utopia, 1920-1947. Here I have argued, contrary to the famous subaltern studies of late Professor Ranaji the Guha and his scores of followers, each of them were bright scholars. But I argued, went against the tide. Subaltern studies talks about uh, masses, subaltern, peasants, and working class people. And subordinate school, as Ranajit Guha puts it, and his associates believe it, that <clears throat> the subaltern has an autonomous domain of culture and consciousness. They are not liable to elite manipulation. Contrary to that, I was bold enough to write a PhD thesis arguing that the sub subalterns are, to paraphrase Karl Marx, sack of potatoes, they don't have any autonomous, independent culture. Or uh, they are subject to elite manipulation and elites cultural hegemony. So the subalterns don't have any autonomous domain of consciousness. They don't decide. For example, Argur, long live revolution. 
or create Bangladesh or create Pakistan. These are all elite slogans, elite program. Elite manipulate them and they think revolution is necessary. Workers of the world unite. Typical Marxian Leninist theory that the masses didn't coin. Lenin, they needed a Lenin. They need, needed a Mao, Gandhi, Jinnah, or Mujib. They can't lead themselves. As Karl Marx said, peasants are sack of potatoes. They cannot move unless moved by somebody else, and they cannot lead themselves. They need some outsiders, elites, to lead them. So they lack consciousness. That was my thesis, <clears throat> and it has been very well taken by various universities, various scholars across the globe. My third book was, <clears throat> as you see, <laughs> Women and Islam in Bangladesh Beyond Subjection and Tyranny. It was about Bangladesh primarily, published by Macmillan Press in 2000. It was a bestseller in Asian Studies. Here I have argued that women don't have friends. Patriarchy is the main problem. Men in general are misogynist and patriarchal, and women have been subject to men's control. And men always hegemonize their, their consciousness and culture. This is also again, <coughs> women have remained subalterns, powerless, marginalized, religion, society, politics, <coughs> and the collective culture of the people everywhere dominated women and still the process is ongo ongoing. This, this is what I argued in my book. <coughs> Anyway, and my third book was, <clears throat> as you see it, Global Jihad in America, The Hundred Year War Beyond Iraq and Afghanistan. This book I wrote while I was teaching at a military college, postgraduate military college in Hawaii, Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, APCSS. While teaching at APCSS from 2007 to 2011, it dawned upon me. I realized that I was at the wrong place. America being the most dominant, hegemonic, hegemonic and nasty, nasty new imperialist country is trying to refurbish its image as a peace-loving country. This is what APCSS teaches to military officers and bureaucrats and diplomats from 40 odd countries from the Asia Pacific. I thought I was a misfit. Then I wrote a book which was contrary to the philosophy of the APCSS. I have not portrayed America as a benign superpower, not as a gentle giant, but as, a, as an intrusive new imperialist warmonger nation. This is what I will be dealing with in my next lecture. I will talk about that, how American neo-imperialist design, American and European, created Israel. And America is almost directly responsible for the deaths of 33,000 Palestinian men, women, and children in Gaza. So Global Jihad in America was published by Sage Publishers. And it, ha it has been translated into Hindi and Marathi by Sage Lan uh, Delhi, New Delhi. And my fifth book is 50 Years of Bangladesh, Crisis of Culture, Development, Governance, and Identity. And my lectures here will mostly cover these areas, crisis of culture. Culture is everywhere. And I'm, I'm, before I finish, I'll mention that 
And meanwhile, I have co-edited two books, one by Macmillan, one by Ralph Lynch. Macmillan's co-edited volume title is titled Islam, Muslims, and the Modern State. And it appraises 13 countries, including Israel and the United States, Britain, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Southeast Asian countries, uh, where Islam, Muslims, and the modern state, the problems. But this book came out in 1994. Second edition came out in 1996, years before the 9-11. Years before 9-11. Here the projection is that Muslims are marginalized. They are peace-loving, but they have been colonized by Europeans. And again, they are subject to neo-colonialism by the United States of America. I wrote this book, we, I co-edited this book before 9-11, and this gives the prehistory of 9-11, why we had Islamic terrorism in the world. So the book gives you the impression that it is the West, not the Islamic world or the Muslims, who have been responsible for terrorism in the name of Islam. It's a reaction. Islamist terrorism, not Islamic, Islamist terrorism and the reaction to Western terrorism and Islamophobia. This is a cultural problem. All problems, mother of all problems is culture. And now in my lectures here, I would explain modern and contemporary Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, and countries in Central Asia and Middle East and Europe and North America and Southeast Asia in the prism of history and culture. So my lectures will be mostly uh, historical, garnished with elements of cultural anthropology, sociology, historical sociology as well. My last book, uh, 50 Years of Bangladesh, is the first historical sociology of Bangladesh, published by Belgrave Macmillan. And so my, my main theme of my lectures would be, will be understanding politics in countries like Bangladesh and Pakistan and India and Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Indonesia and Malaysia and United States of America and Britain with the main theme that whatever problem we see in the running of the country, poverty, backwardness, development, underdevelopment, terrorism, anarchy, everything has a cultural dimension. Main dimension is cultural. So that's why I have got a chapter in my book, Culture Matters. Culture Matters is the title of a volume edited by Lawrence Harrison and the famous Samuel Huntington. Lawrence Harrison is the renowned author of Under Development is a State of Mind. It was published by Basic Books in 2000 from New York. A renowned name. And Lawrence Harrison and Samuel Huntington is the author of so many books especially the author of The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of World Order. I owe my debt to these two renowned professors, not only really because I have borrowed the expression, but I phrased the expression, Culture Matters, actually a title in my book, 50 Years of Bangladesh. I've got a title where I've examined the state of backwardness, poverty, underdevelopment, corruption and bad governance in the prism of culture matters. So my lectures here will be culture matters. And I have my humble self, I have theorized one thing, that is all wars are trade wars. I will be talking on this theme as well, that whatever we see the difference between America and India, America and China, India and China, Bangladesh and India, 
the, the root cause is economic. Adam Smith's the hidden hand, the hand is invisible hand of Adam Smith is economic. Economic problem is at the root of every problem. So I've, I've brought the used the expression trade wars. Trade wars means capturing or uh, occupying uh, land or sources of raw material, oil or wheat or gas or uranium or iron ore and market. Capturing raw materials and market. That is what human beings have been doing even before the dawn of civilization. Maybe pastoral economy also based on this, who will have better uh, land to graze their uh, cattle or goat or sheep. So it's all about occupying land and sources of raw material and market. So all wars, including the Crusades fought between Europe, West Europe and the Arabs in the medieval period, 12th, 13th century, 14th century, were basically trade wars, would capture the trade route, market and raw materials. So, so my lectures, I will follow the doctrine and or thesis called culture matters in my lectures and presentations. And as I told you, this is what I have been doing to understand contemporary Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, and post-colonial world, and Europe, and America. My lectures will cover a wide range of countries, as I told you, from South Asia to the Middle East, Europe, North America, Southeast Asia, from historical and contemporary perspectives. And cultural dimensions of the problems of bad governance, underdevelopment, corruption, identity crisis will remain the linch pins of or a foci of my deliberations. And history, Islam, cultural anthropology, historical sociology, and political science will be the main areas of my uh, deliberation and discussion and it will be cross-disciplinary by nature. As you know, you possibly, many of you know that I've got a Bengali channel titled Taj Hashmi's World and this is exclusively will be an English channel called Taj Hashmi's Reading History and Culture. Culture means religion, politics, everything, our day-to-day -day activities. And I hope we'll have a fruitful uh, partnership. And you feel free to ask questions. Uh, and I will try to answer them in my following deliberation. And then thus we'll have a dialogue. And you will feel free to email me or even call me or phone me. I'm available. I would like to have a discussion with you. And this is how we will learn from each other. It will be mutual learning. And I will apply critical thinking methodology. I will, I will try to learn things or uh, explain things by asking optimum number of questions to do critical thinking. Because I, th I think there is a mother of knowledge, all knowledge, as Socrates has devised this, learning through questioning. So with this, I introduce myself and my subject matter, which I will try to deliver every day of the week or at least five to six days a week. Hope to have a fruitful interaction. And thank you again for your patience and look, looking forward to seeing you have to participate or to watch my programs. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.